In part A, we are asked whether the circuit shown in the diagram can be reduced to a single resistor connected to the batteries. Now, if we scroll down here and take a closer look at the circuit, we of course can see that this circuit contains two batteries. And in general, if a circuit contains two or more batteries, then it cannot be simplified to just a single resistor. So the answer here to part A is simply no, because there is more than one battery. So trying to reduce it to a single resistor is going to be futile. That means we're going to have to take a different approach for part B, which asks us to find the magnitude of the current and its direction in each resistor. So that means that we're going to have to follow the following procedure. In step one of this procedure, we need to draw in all the currents. Sometimes that is done for you in a picture, but in this case it is not. Now, how many currents do we need to draw? Well, we have to draw them for each branch of the circuit. Now, a branch would just be a unique wire. So this wire right here would be a branch. The wire that cuts across the middle of the circuit is a branch. And then the wire that traverses the bottom half of the circuit is a branch. So we actually have to draw in a current for each of those three branches. Let's start with the upper branch. We can choose to draw the current either in a clockwise fashion if we wish to do so, or a counterclockwise fashion. The initial choice is arbitrary, so don't sweat it too much. If your choice turns out to be wrong, what will happen is the calculated current will be negative, and then all you have to do is go back and switch the direction of the current that you drew and make your current positive. So it's really not a major deal, but a tip that you might want to follow when drawing in the currents is that typically, though not always, typically we draw the current being produced and flowing away from the positive terminal of the battery. So that's a good rule of thumb is to project your current away from the positive terminal. And therefore we would draw in this fashion in a clockwise fashion. We'll go ahead and call this I1. Similarly, through the middle branch of the circuit, we can draw a current that is projecting away from that positive terminal. We will call that I2. Now for the bottom branch, we want to be a little bit careful here because if we notice I1 is flowing towards this little junction that we've marked with a lowercase d. I2 is also moving towards that junction as well. And so if I1 and I2 are going into that little junction, we better make sure that some of the current is coming out of the junction. You can't have all the current going in, and therefore we want to make sure I3 is traveling in that direction. So that's your first step, is to draw in those currents. The second step is to apply the junction rule. Now a junction is just where wires come together, where unique wires come together. We actually have a junction at A as well as a junction at D. We can use either one of them. Why don't we choose junction D because we've already spoken about it. Again, at junction D, we can see I1 and I2 are going into the junction and then I3 is going out. And the junction rule basically says that the total current that's going into the junction will have to equal the total current that's going out of the junction. So the current going into junction D was I1 as well as I2, and then the current going out of the junction was I3. So that would be our first equation. We're going to need two more though, because we have three unknowns, the three currents. So with three unknowns, we need three equations, and that means we're going to have to look at the loop rule. Now to understand the loop rule, why don't we come a little bit lower here and redraw the circuit. Now, for the loop rule, what we want to do is choose one continuous loop through the circuit. And for example, if we started at point A and we moved in a clockwise direction and returned to point A, that would constitute a loop. And that's actually a good loop for us to use. So let's take a look at loop A, B, C, D, E. Now, as we traverse the loop, we need to keep track of potential changes. So let's see what that looks like. Let's start at point A and begin moving in a clockwise fashion until we encounter the 20 volt battery. Now, if you'll notice, because we're moving clockwise, we're moving from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the battery. And anytime you move from a negative to a positive terminal, your potential change will be positive. And therefore, as we go through this battery, our potential change will simply be positive 20 volts. We will omit units for clarity, but all of these will be in volts. Then as we move past the battery and continue our journey through our loop, we encounter a 30 ohm resistor. Now for resistors, potential change is equal to the resistance multiplied by the current. That is basically Ohm's law. We can see that as we move through the 30 ohm resistor, we are moving in the same direction as the current. 
So we're moving to the right through our loop, and the current is also moving to the right through this branch of the circuit. Whenever you move in the same direction as current, please make sure your potential change is negative. So for this resistor, we will have a minus, take the resistance value of 30 ohms, and then multiply by the current I1. So we move through that 30 ohm resistor, continue clockwise, make a turn down here, and we will be going through the 5 ohm resistor. But this time, if you look at the direction of I2, we would be moving against the current. We're moving to the left through this particular branch and the current is moving to the right. Because we're moving against the current, that is always a positive potential change. So you'll take a plus sign, you'll take the resistance value, and you'll multiply it by the current I2. Then we continue in a clockwise fashion. We encounter this battery. This time, we're moving from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So going from positive to negative is a negative potential change, and therefore you, you will write minus 10 volts there. And then finally, you return to point A right here, and anytime you return to your starting point, you set the total potential changes equal to zero. Now we can clean this up just a little bit because we have 20 minus 10. So why don't we just write that as 10 minus 30 I1 plus 5 I2. This is equal to zero. And this is our second of three equations. To get the third equation, we're going to do another loop rule. This time, why don't we choose the loop that also starts at point A and also goes clockwise, but this time we'll kind of move down the bottom branch of the circuit. So that would be loop A, D, E, uh, F, and then back to point A. Starting at point A, we're going to be moving in that direction to the right clockwise, and that's going from the negative to the positive terminal. That's a positive potential change, positive 10 volts. We go through the 5 ohm resistor again, but this time, because we're moving to the right, we would be flowing with the current marked I2. Remember, that's a negative potential change. And then you take the resistance of 5, multiply it by the current I2. Now we take a turn and go through the bottom branch. We are going this direction here. We are flowing with the current marked I3. So that's another negative potential change. And the resistance value through the 20 ohm resistor is 20, multiplied by the current flowing through it, I3. And then we continue on through our loop, and there's really no other circuit elements until we return to point A. Therefore, we can just set that equal to 0. So that loop was a little bit easier. We have our second equation here. And why don't we go ahead and grab the other equation from our junction rule, because we're definitely going to be needing that. So we'll copy that and bring it down to our little analysis below. And we can see that I3 was equal to I1 plus I2. So we're going to make a substitution. Very often what you'll do is take your junction rule equation and make a substitution into one of your loop rule equations. So right there we have an I3. So why don't we rewrite this equation as 10 minus 5i2 minus 20 times i1 plus i2, and then set that equal to 0. We can simplify this, of course, by distributing the negative 20. So why don't we just sneak down here. We'll have 10 minus 5i2 minus 20i1 minus 20i2 is equal to 0. We have some like terms, don't we? We have the negative 5i2 and the negative 20i2, so we'll have 10 minus 25i2 minus 20i1 equals 0. Very nice. Now you go back and you take your first loop rule equation, which we will see also contains the same variables, i1 and i2, and you're going to do a little substitution, or excuse me, a little elimination method here. We might want to actually take this equation and just rearrange it. We want the I1 term to come first and then the I2. So let's just do a little rearrangement of that equation and rewrite it as 10 minus 20 I1 minus 25 I2 equals 0. So these are the two key equations for elimination. You want to create opposite coefficients. So for example, right here you have a positive 5 and here you have a negative 25. You want opposites, so you want one to be positive and one to be negative, which we have, but we want the coefficient values to be the same. And the only way to do that, or the best way to do that, would be to multiply this first equation by 5. So that would create 50 minus 150i1 plus 25i2 equals 0. And then for this equation, we can just carry it down below uh, 10 minus 20i1 minus 25 i2 equals 0. Now we have opposite coefficients in front of i2. We can add the equations together. 
So 50 plus 10, of course, is 60. Negative 150 plus negative, negative 20 is negative 170i1. These will cancel, and then you'll set this equal to zero. You can add the 170i1 to the other side, and then divide both sides by 170. When you do that, you will see that I1 is roughly 0.353 amps. We can backtrack and obtain I2 rather easily. We can maybe take this equation. There's others you could use, but basically find an equation that contains I1 and I2 and plug in your I1 value. So you'll have 10 minus 20 times the 0.353 amps minus 25 I2 equals zero. Let's punch this into our calculator and see what that becomes. That should end up as 2.94, roughly. Let's also add the 25 I2 to the other side and then divide both sides by 25 and you get 0.118, roughly, for I2. That's in amps. And then finally, we need I3, but that's the easiest one to find of them all because I3 from our junction rule was I1 plus I2. So I3 was just I1 plus I2. Therefore, we take our I1 value and add the I2 value. And when we do that, we will see that I3 comes out to 0.471 approximately amps. Now, notice all the currents were positive. This is wonderful, actually. That means that the original directions that we selected for the currents were correct. So the direction of I1, which was sort of in a clockwise direction, is correct. I2 is traveling to the right. That's correct. I3 was going in a clockwise direction. Those are all correct because all of our currents came out positive. If one of them turned out to be negative, for example, if this was negative, you would actually go back to the diagram for that current, in this hypothetical case, I1, and you would switch the direction. So you'd cross that off and flip it to that direction. But that's only if the current turned out to be negative in value. Ours did not, so all of our directions that we had chosen were correct. And so that concludes the answers to this question.